Today we're talking about it's a new day, and we're looking at Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through uh, 22. You know, uh, I was wondering if it would be appropriate for a pastor to say from the pulpit that uh, Bill, Bill Maher is a jerk. And I considered that carefully and decided I, I wouldn't say Bill Maher is a jerk. Um, Bill Maher is a comedian and he has a show on HBO and he used to have a show called Politically Incorrect and uh, he's quite well known as being someone that's very antagonistic toward uh, any uh, one that believes in religion. It doesn't have to be uh, just Christianity, it could be any kind of religion. And uh, as a result of that, he uh, has uh, made a lot of comments about Christianity in particular, calling it a myth and so on. And so nowadays we have many atheists and neo-pagans and other disbelievers of Christianity that, that claim that uh, the story of Jesus Christ was borrowed from earlier mythologies. And in recent years they uh, uh, have made some claims that Jesus is really based on the Egyptian god Horus. And uh, Horus, you remember, was one of the oldest Egyptian deities, and many times you see in the Egyptian uh, paintings, uh, he looks like a falcon or a man with a falcon head. And you've probably seen those uh, on uh, different paintings from the Egyptian uh, past. But um, the reason why I say Bill Maher is, is a jerk is because my definition of a jerk is someone that promotes something that uh, is supposedly true when in fact it's not based on anything and therefore is a lie. And that's the way Bill Maher operates. You see, uh, these skeptical claims about Jesus are not always the same. Some say he was a primitive teacher who uh, his followers later tried to deify him and uh, they adopted other God-like figures from the past in order to uh, say this related to Jesus. Others say it's just a, a matter of different myths that have been accumulated to uh, say that Jesus is uh, God or the Son of God. But in the 2008 film uh, Religulous, uh, it's a combination of the name religion and ridiculous, uh, Bill Maher uh, kind of just brings this kind of attitude to a head in the show. And uh, he's interviewing uh, an unsuspecting Christian who's he was just pulled aside, and uh, he's, he asked the Christian what he believes, and the Christian says what he believes, and then uh, Bill Maher says, but the Jesus story wasn't original. And the Christian says, well, how so? And Maher says, written in 1280 B.C., the Book of the Dead describes the god Horus. Horus is the son of the god Osiris, born to a virgin mother. He was baptized in a river by Anup the baptizer, who was later beheaded. And like Jesus, Horus was tempted while alone in the desert, healed the sick, the blind, cast out demons, and walked on water. He raised Asar from the dead. Asar translates to Lazarus. And oh yeah, he also had 12 disciples. And yes, Horus was crucified first, and after three days, two women announced Horus, the savior of humanity, had been resurrected. Now, Mars is repeating uh, what many people are saying nowadays, uh, the the fact of the matter is, is that what he just related is not related to history at all and to the stories of Horus. And he accumulates things together that are just not true when you go back and study the Egyptian god Horus. But it's easy for someone to pull these things together and say that the Jesus myth is based on the Horus myth. And it says more about what the person who believes that uh, believes rather than it does about the facts of history itself. And you can go through, I've got like six pages here that goes through each one of those points that was made uh, claiming to be true when in fact uh, it can be refuted quite easily from historical data and so on. Another, another thing that's been surfacing is uh, something that was uh, sent out by uh, Richard Dawkins uh, and his foundation for reason and science. And they have this little uh, mem that says uh, Ishtar is pronounced Easter. Easter was originally the celebration of Ishtar, the Assyrian 
and Babylonian goddess of fertility and sex. Her symbols, like the egg and the bunny, were and are still fertility and sex symbols. Or did you actually think eggs and bunnies had anything to do with the resurrection? After Constantine decided uh, to Christianize the empire, Easter was changed to represent Jesus. But at its roots, Easter, which is how you pronounce Ishtar, is all about celebrating fertility and sex. Now that sounds real damning of Christianity, doesn't it? As if we borrowed something from other religions and made it our own. The, the fact of the matter is, is that none of that's true. Amen. And yet it's being passed off as something that's intelligent and academic and very true. Uh, for instance, just a, a minor thing, uh, Ishtar uh, was not pronounced Easter. That's just a minor thing. And uh, her symbols were not the egg and the bunny. In fact, matter of fact, they were uh, something else quite different. Uh, they had other symbols that represented Ishtar. And um, there's just different things. Ishtar wasn't uh, an Eastern goddess at all. In fact, she was a Germanic goddess named Estor or Ostara, and she was the goddess of the dawn. And, and so uh, all of these things are brought together by people that don't claim to have a belief in God, and they use these things to attack Christianity as if it's a myth, and therefore any reasonable person would not believe in Christianity at all. But what about serious scholarship? What about those who actually uh, delve into the past and look at history as it is? Those that don't have an axe to grind. Those that uh, aren't being jerks. What about people like that? What about, what about a guy named uh, Jacob Jeremias? Uh, he was uh, a European scholar, by no means an evangelical or a fundamentalist Christian, but he was a Christian. And he's a New Testament scholar, and, and he makes this startling claim as he studies the life of Jesus. And he goes back through and sorts through all the facts about Jesus and so on, all about his life, and he gets down to the, the pericopes, the sayings, the words of Jesus, the setting of Jesus. And here's what he says. Jesus' parables are something entirely new. In all the rabbinic literature, not one single parable has come down to us from the period before Jesus. We stand right before Jesus when reading his parables. So, Bill, Jesus was a fabrication and myth? Then how did these new things come to be? You see, the parables of Jesus are unique. They contain the native language of Jesus, the scenes of everyday Palestine, and the core elements of Jesus' message, and the basic conflict that his preaching produced. And, and the words of Jesus, painted with his parables, resisted the religious stagnation, the spiritual confusion, and the Roman militarism of his day. So he, as we come to the parables... We come to something that's entirely unique Amen. to history. Jeremiah says, oh yeah, Rabbi Hillel had a couple analogies that he used, but they were by no means parables in the sense Jesus told parables. Jesus contributed something new to mankind and, and just by saying his parables. Amen. And we're confronted with a unique person in history and, and someone who made claims about himself. And the parables were his primary source of making those claims. And so as you look at the parables of Jesus, suddenly you realize that Jesus intentionally used the parables to present the good news that the kingdom of God was at hand. And, and so today we're going to look at the parables, and the next few Sundays we'll look at some other parables, and we'll see what Jesus intended when he used those parables. And, and we, will, we dispense with uh, the Bill Mars and the Richard Dawkins and all their skepticism based upon uh, questionable scholarship. You see, the parables we're going to look at this morning are the parables of the new garment and the new wine in Mark chapter 2. And they reveal that 
Salvation has come in the person of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, look at Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. <clears throat> now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? And Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have with him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins of both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. Now the setting for this passage is this. The chapter 2 starts out where Jesus uh, goes to Capernaum and uh, he, he goes to a certain house and people hear he's there. They all come running. The place fills up. It's crowded. Uh, four men bring uh, this paralytic friend of theirs uh, to be healed, but they can't get in, so they go to the roof, they tear it apart layer by layer, and they drop the paralytic right in front of Jesus. And Jesus is trying to uh, explain uh, who he is and what he believes to the Pharisees and scribes, representatives, as well as the crowd that's come to hear him. And here this paralytic's dropped in front of him. And so Jesus, knowing the hearts of the Pharisees, says, uh, your sins are forgiven you. And and the Pharisees are, are thinking, who is this guy? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. But you have to understand, uh, the sin was equated with someone's illness and disease. And so in the Jewish mindset, if someone was sick, like this paralyzed man, it must have been some sin he committed or some sin his parents committed or some sin someone in the family committed to cause him to be that way. And so Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, looks at them and says, um, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or is it easier to say get up and walk and be healed? And they don't answer him. And so Jesus looks at the man and say, I say unto you, get up and walk and be healed. And the man stands up and rejoices and goes out and all the people are astonished. Amen. And the Pharisees and the scribes uh, I, I just can't explain it because their whole theory was that Jesus was performing blasphemy when he claimed to forgive sins, and yet here they had evidence that he healed a man, so therefore, who must this guy be? And it goes against everything they believe. Well, Jesus goes on out and he calls Levi as he's walking along the lake there. He sees Levi uh, there in that area of Capernaum, and he is uh, collecting taxes, not for the Romans, but for King Herod. And uh, he's much despised. People hate tax collectors. And yet Jesus looks at Levi, who we know as Matthew, and he says, get up and follow me. And Matthew leaves it all behind. Amen. He rejects it all and follows Jesus. And as a result of that, he becomes his disciple. And, and Matthew, of course, probably a very wealthy man, invites Jesus to come to his house for a meal. And, and as they're all sitting there, the Pharisees are upset and they're, they're looking around saying, why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why is he hanging out with those people? Doesn't he know he's going to be unclean? Doesn't he know he's breaking ceremonial law? If he was truly a religious man, truly a pious man, he wouldn't associate with people like this. And so Jesus responds to them. We'll see in a few minutes how he responded. And that brings us to our passage today where this whole question of fasting came up because uh, John's disciples, probably around this time, John had already uh, been in prison and uh, his disciples are probably fasting in prayer and mourning, hoping he'll be released. Uh, and uh, the Pharisees, of course, uh, uh, fasted two days a week, even though the law only required them to fast one time of the year, and that was in the Day of Atonement. And uh, yet they did that to show how pious they were, how close to God they were by fasting. And so they asked the question, 
Why aren't your disciples fasting? And Jesus has some answers for them. But that, that brings us to this whole uh, question of the parables and how they're used. And so Jesus uses some parables here to announce a couple of things. One way, uh, he's announcing that he brings a new day. He brings a new day. A whole new era is being ushered in because Jesus has come. Jesus is present with us. And he describes his coming as a wedding celebration. And he is the bridegroom. Did you notice that? It's a time not to fast, but it's a time to feast now. Because the bridegroom is celebrating the wedding. And Jesus is with his guests. He's with those who are part of the wedding ceremony. And he's celebrating this time together. So why should they fast? The bridegroom is with them. That's what it says in verses 19 through 20. Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot. So long as they have him with them, the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. And so it's quite simple, Jesus says. I'm still here. And they're celebrating. But, but notice the last phrase there. The bridegroom will be taken from them. And here Jesus predicts his coming death. Amen. He will die and then his disciples will fast. Amen. Then his disciples will mourn because he's been taken from them. But right now he's with them. And so it's a time of feasting, not fasting. It's a time of celebration. You see, life with Jesus is a life of joy. Amen. That's what he wants us to have. It's not a life of mourning and moaning. It's a life of joy and celebration. As long as Jesus is present, we have life. And we have it more abundantly. And we can celebrate with him. And and as Jesus goes along, he gives an illustration. He starts using these parables. And and notice that the parables that Jesus uses are, are parables that anyone, whether they were a trained scholar or just an everyday normal person goes about their daily task they would all understand he talks about garments and wine and they understood notice what he says jesus did not come to repair the old system he came to establish a new era and a new way of doing things this is why he had come this is why he can celebrate with his disciples because a new age has come in A new time has come in. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's breaking in upon everyone. And it's breaking in because he is there. The bridegroom is there. And it's a time when he brings in a whole new system, a whole new way of doing things. And so in in chapter 2, verse 21 and 22, Jesus says this, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece would pull away from the old, making the tear worse. Now, this looks like a pair of jeans I used to wear. Okay. And uh, it was quite common then when you had to repair something, an old garment, you, you didn't use unshrunk cloth. It, you used old cloth to patch. Because if you use the unshrunk cloth, when it was washed when it got wet, that, that would draw together and pull the old garment's material and probably rip it and tear it apart. Uh, probably everybody there listening to him that day understood what he was talking about. And that's what a parable is all about. It, it's taking an everyday common idea and presenting through it the message he wants to deliver. And what is the message? The message is this. The old is passing away. Behold, the new has come. And Jesus is the new. He's the one bringing something entirely new. He can't repair the old system. He he can't fix up and restore the broken down way they had been doing things. It just won't work. He's establishing something entirely new. It's a new day, a new era, a new way of doing things. But he gives another uh, parable, and he says, No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, 
and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. And so the same principle is involved here. If you have an old wineskin, you don't put new wine into it. Why? Because the new wine is still fermenting. It's still releasing gases. It's still expanding. And so if you have an old wineskin, it's going to expand to the point where it bloats out and may explode. And so Jesus says you need an entirely new wineskin if you're going to put in new wine. That way it can expand as the uh, gases contract and expand and so on. And so the same principle. Something new has come. The old is passing away. The new has come. It's a new day. And Jesus is the one that ushers in that new day. You remember back when Jesus went to his hometown? He'd been going around to the different synagogues. And he comes home. And and there he's uh, worshiping with them in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And they ask him to read the scripture. And so Jesus picks up uh, the scripture, Isaiah 61, and he reads the passage, and then he sits down, and he looks around, and he says, Today these words have been fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. What was he doing? Well, Jesus quoted Isaiah 61 to describe his mission and this new day we're talking about. What were the verses he read? They're these. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, Because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. You see, that was Jesus' mission. The Holy Spirit was upon him. The Holy Spirit had a mission for him. And the first was to preach good news. And he was going to take it to all those who were impoverished. Spiritually as, as well as physically. And then he goes on. And he says, He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You see, later on, John's disciples came to Jesus and they said, John wants us to know if you're really the one who's to come, if you're really the Messiah. And Jesus, what does he do? He doesn't say, yes, I am. Go back and tell him not to worry about it. What he does, he says, tell him what you see. The lame walk, the blind see. The poor celebrate and rejoice. The prisoners are set free. He's using his mission statement to tell John, I'm doing everything I told you I was going to do. I'm fulfilling the mission God has called me to do. And what is it? It's to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is nothing more than the year of jubilee. It's a time when the prisoners are set free. It's a time when the debtors are uh, renewed from their debt, the release from their debt. It's a time when people that were in bondage no longer had to be in bondage. They could go back and start over. It was a fresh start. And Jesus says, I'm here, and I am bringing in the Jubilee. I'm the one that's releasing the prisoners. I'm the one that's healing the sick. I'm the one that's giving sight to the blind. I'm the one that's releasing the poor from their debts. I'm the one who's bringing all this in. It's a new age. It's a new day. And notice what that day is. It's a day of the Lord's favor. Amen? Amen. And so when we say Jesus is bringing in a new day, what it means is it's the new day of Jesus that brings joy and favor to all who receive him. When you get become part of the wedding party, When you become part of the feast, you're going to have joy and favor because you're in the presence of Jesus. And so the question is, are you still part of the old system or are you part of the new system? Are you still doing things the old way or are you doing things the Jesus way? You see? And and so, so often we, we have this old way creep in, this way of rules and regulations and restrictions and people looking nice and people acting nice and people going through the motions but they don't have any kind of change within and Jesus says be free rejoice I have come and I'm here to set you free and proclaim favor and joy into your life so you can follow God and rejoice him and you can follow me 
and be part of my family forever. Have you received Jesus? Are you part of his new day? Well, you see, there's a second part to what we see here in this passage this morning, and that is uh, part of what I just explained in introducing uh, the text about fasting. Jesus brings in a new way, a new way of doing things. He, he not only ushers in this new age, this new day, he, he also brings a new way of going about things. And, and this is where we have to go back and remind ourselves over and over about this. You, you see, Jesus transforms the lives and habits of sinful and misguided people. That's what he does. That, that's, that's his sole purpose, yes, is to come in and change your life, Amen. to set you free. And, and you could be a person that's a good moral person. He could set you free. Amen. You could be a despi despicable wretch, a horrible person, and he could set you free. Amen. The fact of the matter is, is that we all need to be set free. And Jesus is the one that can do that. We see that in Levi's life, don't we? He says, once again, there are verse 13 and 14. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and began to, he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Levi got up and followed him. We don't know much about how uh, Levi or Matthew had known about Jesus previous to this. My guess is that Jesus had been in the area quite often and, and Levi had heard about him and, and wondered about him and, and, and began to ask questions of other people about him. And he began to realize that here's a guy that could take away the stigma I have of being a cheat and a thief Amen. as a tax collector. And so when Jesus came to him and said, follow me, he didn't hesitate. That's right. He didn't hesitate. This is, a, this is a way for me to get a new life Amen. and to change what I've been doing and to follow Jesus. And he got up and followed him. Amen. He left it all. He, he left everything. A secure job, secure future, yes, wealth. All of it. He left it because he wanted something more. He wanted a changed life. Amen. He was tired of being the hypocrite, tired of being the thief, tired of being the cheat, tired of being the one that was always outcast and put down, tired of all that kind of living. Amen. He wanted to follow Jesus because he wanted a new life. He wanted to be set free. Amen. And when Jesus called him, Matthew followed Jesus. Now that may be you this morning. You may want to set for, be set free. You, you may be addicted to something, and you're tired of it, and you want to be set free, and he can do that. Amen. You, you may be a person that is in a situation where you know you're doing something wrong, you're hurting others as a result of that, and you want to be set free, and Jesus can set you free if you follow him. You see, whatever your situation is, Jesus can set you free if you're willing to let the past go and to follow him, just like he did with Matthew. So Jesus transforms lives, and he transforms the habits of sinful and misguided people. But also, Jesus rescues sick and hurting people instead of maintaining the rigid rules and regulations of those who think they are well. Over and over, Jesus has to defend himself against the scribes and Pharisees. Now listen, we really, we really criticize the Pharisees, but, but they were the ultra-fundamentalists of their day. They were the Bible believers. They believed the Bible so much, they added rules and regulations to it to make sure they followed the Bible. Amen. Sounds like a lot of independent Baptist churches, doesn't it? Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Sounds like all Baptist churches. You see, they were, they were the good guys, religiously, the Sadducees were the liberals. They were the conservatives. And, and yet Jesus is always bucking heads with them. Amen. He's always in conflict with them. And he always, whenever a parable is told, it usually deals with something the scribes and Pharisees are not doing right. 
And he's able to tell the parable, and the scribes and Pharisees can see themselves in the parable. Whenever couples come to me for counseling, and they've been at loggerheads, they just argue and fight, argue and fight over and over and over. And, and, and usually what happens is one, one spouse will say, well, you always, and immediately the other spouse throws up their defenses and says, that's not true. And so they hurl something back, well, you always, and so it's, it's just a constant battle. So I say, wait, wait, slow down, back up. Let, let's do something here. Instead of attacking by saying, you always do this, or you always do that, or remember when you did that, maybe what you need to do is this. Maybe what you need to do is just paint a picture. Paint a picture. Describe how you feel by painting a picture. And let, the person, let your spouse see what that picture is. And then you say, when you do this, this is how it makes me feel. And that way they're able to back off. They're able to hear the other person. And they're able to see themselves in the story or the picture that's been painted. That's what Jesus does with the parables. He places those parables out there so people can see themselves in their situation and make some changes as a result. Rather than pointing a finger and saying, you're wrong, he paints a picture and says, what do you see? Amen. And suddenly they see a mirror and they see who they really are. You see, that's what Jesus does. And he was tired of the rules and regulations these Pharisees had, had put people into, backed them into corners to the place where they couldn't even operate, they couldn't even breathe, they couldn't even go and do anything as a matter of worship without feeling guilty. Right. Now Jesus said, remember, it's a new day. It's time for joy and celebration. It's time for the favor of the Lord instead of the condemnation of the Lord. And, and so Jesus comes in and he says, look, there's a new way. I'm going to rescue people and help people rather than condemn people and destroy them. Notice what he says there in verses 16 to 17. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Amen. And he goes right back to his mission. Why did he come? To set people free. He didn't come for those who were healthy. He came for those who were sick. He came to rescue those who needed help. He came to set people free. He came to minister to their needs and bring forgiveness and health to their lives. So that's the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is something entirely different than the way the world operates. The world operates with a standard of if you measure up to this, then we'll accept you. If you don't, then we'll condemn you. But there's another way. Jesus said it's like this. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Amen. This is the new way of the new age. This is the new way of the era Jesus brought into being. This is the way we're to operate as individuals, as churches, as communities of faith, this is the way we're to operate in this world. And the world is to look at us and say, hey, Jesus is real because I see you all loving one another. Amen. And that way we don't have to worry about what Richard Dawkins or Bill Maher say. People will look at us and say, I'm convinced, not by the words you say, but by the actions you have toward one another. You love one another. And it's something I don't see around me in the world. And see, if Jesus' way is operated the way it's supposed to be, we don't have to worry about convincing anyone. They're going to be willing to follow Jesus. And so here we are with these two parables. The parables of the new garment and the new wine reveal that salvation has come 
in the person and work of Jesus. Salvation has come in the person and work of Jesus. It's a new day, and he has brought a new way. Are you willing, like Levi, to follow him? Are you willing to just let the chains fall off? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, should die for me? Let's pray together. Father, as we close this morning, our prayer is that each of us will realize that we've been set free through Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. And he has ushered in a new age, a new way, a new era. And we can follow him and be set free from our past, from our sins, from all the things that hold us down. And we don't have to operate by the world's standards. We can operate through forgiveness and love based upon what he did for us on the cross. If there's one here today, Father, that wants to follow Jesus and have never personally accepted him as Lord and Savior, may they just pray something like this, Oh God, I want to be a part of your family. I want to turn from my old way and, and follow the new way of Jesus. Like Levi, I want to follow Jesus. I believe you died on the cross for me, Jesus, to forgive my sins. I believe you, Father, that you raised your son, Jesus, from the dead. And now he has the power to set me free. Come into my life, Jesus. Forgive my sin. Make me a new person on the inside and change my behavior on the outside. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning or something similar to it, we invite you to come and share that with us publicly. This is why we give you the opportunity to come each Sunday at an invitation time to say, I want to follow Jesus. Are you willing to do that this morning? As we stand and sing the invitation hymn this morning, you come, the Savior is waiting to enter your